It's a co-working space for blockchain and Web3 initiatives. It was founded by Gnosis, which is the company that I work at, and Cosmos, which works on an interoperable blockchain protocol. Um, so I work at Gnosis, which works on things like prediction markets on Ethereum, where is blockchain. Um, and if you want to contact me, I'm in the key base, but also feel free to email me, find me on Twitter. Also, these are the links for the full node and Gnosis. Um, and this space is really nice. Um, it's been open for about a year and a half now. And quite frequently over here, we have uh, like meetups every week from blockchain, Rust, peer-to-peer, -peer, everything. And also for community events, um, we try to give a discount and provide the space for free. So if you guys also ever want to do anything, community events or whatever, just get in touch with me. Um, and we also have a party next week, which I'll invite you all to. Um, so, and starting with decentralized governance, um, when I was thinking about how to put this talk together, I figured it would be good to begin with some definitions. And I know that this is your last lecture, so I'm sorry if there's any redundancy. There's a few memes that I'm like, definitely someone has used these memes in the slides so far. Um, and it will be kind of a more discursive introduction to decentralized governance with some technical aspects. And then Pat will take it over and give some examples of DAOs and organizations that exist today. And we'll ideally try to create what is called a DAO together. Um, and that will just give, not necessarily that it's tooling that's so far ahead or so useful at the moment, but it might give you an introduction to how to use kind of Web3 tooling at present day. So just to start with some definitions, um, because there's often a lot of um, conflation when people talk about decentralized governance. So the working definition for governance in this presentation you could define as the process of decision making and the process by which decisions are implemented or not implemented. So it's both how decisions are made and the process by which they are enacted. But then Vlad, who's a person in the Ethereum space, said it's also the process of establishing the legitimacy of how decisions are made. So how do you have authority to make decisions in the first place? So governance for this talk could be defined as the legitimated process of decision making and how they're implemented. But then what is decentralization? Um, so I think you've probably talked about decentralization a lot in all of the lectures. Uh, it was a term that was first used, at least in kind of Anglo-Saxon Latin-based languages by de Tocqueville talking about the French Revolution, saying that decentralization of political power was a goal um, and that the French Revolution did not achieve it. Um, but what are decentralized systems instead, which is what we're talking about in a peer-to-peer -peer context, so you could say decentralized systems are, these are two definitions from like a paper on peer-to-peer -peer tech in 1999 before it was like super popular. So you could say um, one requirement is that the agents, um, some decisions made by agents involved in a decentralized system are made without centralized control or processing. But one thing that I found really interesting about this definition is that um, an important, important property of agent systems or decentralized systems is the degree of connectivity or connectedness between the agents. So it's not necessarily the aut autonomy of the agents themselves or actors in a decentralized network, but it's also their ability to freely communicate with one another. So I'm sure this probably came up in at least one of the lectures. So I think people always <coughs> talk about you know, decentralized, distributed, centralized, and say you know, it's the ability to not go through a central node, but it's so much about the ability of the connectedness between the nodes. People always emphasize the centrality in that really the opposite. So for this lecture, we could say that decentralized systems grant that agents in the system have relational autonomy. So this is both that they have the ability to autonomously make decisions about the state of the system or to cast a vote, but also that they have relative autonomy to each other, where they can communicate the state or the vote to each other without having a centralized kind of node to process that authority. Um, and so you could say that since the update does not have to pass through a centralized authority, you could define an update as in a social system, like a vote, um, or in a technical system, like a state change. And one could consider in a vague way that the centralized authority could be the process of the protocol that's the, the legitimating force and kind of acts as an evenly distributed authority, but that gets us in a semantic kind of wormhole, so we're not gonna go there entirely. Um, so there is the question of who governs, what nodes in the system govern, so political parties, markets, peers, or all of the above. Um, there's also the question of who governs what, so policy making, resources, or technical systems. 
Um, and as you know, that decentralization can mean a lot of different things to many people and also mask a lot of different competing motivations, particularly in peer-to-peer -peer ideology. Um, so I think the most important thing to note just by way of this introduction is that the decentralization of political or social processes are often wrongly conflated with the decentralization of technical systems. So you might have a vote that's like direct democracy and you could say that's decentralized, everyone casts a vote, you make that decision. Um, but when you're talking about a trustless computer network, that doesn't map one-to-one -to, -one to the social organization that it produces. And I think it introduces a lot of kind of, as we talk about it, hopefully as a group, we'll see the confusion that it produces. Um, so while decentralized social systems are informed, decentralized technical systems and vice versa, they're not synonymous. Um, and one big piece that really illustrates this, and there's a slide with resources um, that I'll share at the end that are just a bunch of pieces to read. So you probably know Vitalik Buterin, he, he was the co-founder of Ethereum. Um, are you guys familiar with Ethereum? So Ethereum is like a blockchain protocol, so there's Bitcoin, which originally came up, and that was basically to use peer-to-peer -peer money, or something like a coin or currency that you could use on a peer-to-peer -peer network. And then basically a couple of years later, young computer scientists, a few other people, so Vitalik, one of them, um, were like, oh, this is really interesting because not only can you have a peer-to-peer -peer network that uses a coin or currency, you can have a peer-to-peer -peer network that builds applications that use coins or currency. So Ethereum is kind of building on the Bitcoin idea, but in the idea that you could build an app kind of like um, Twitter that has one kind of decentralized state storage system but also involves currency. Um, well, that's kind of more the vision today. It wasn't so much in 2016. Um, so he has this piece called Meaning of Decentralization um, and tries to also disambiguate the different meanings of decentralization in terms of governance. So you could say that architectural decentralization um, is a question of how many physical computers is a system made up of um, and how many of those computers can tolerate it breaking down at any single time. So if you have um, in a peer-to-peer -peer system 12 different computers that are kind of all communicating with each other, um, how many of those computers have to be actively updating and communicating with each other to not have the system still exist? And then there's also political decentralization. So um, how many individuals or organizations ultimately control the computers or the technical system that the system's made up of? Um, there's also logical decentralization. So this is more on the kind of, you could say almost the resources that are being governed, but this piece is specifically talking about data structures. So if you were to cut like a database table in half, would it still make sense? Is it distributed enough amongst all the nodes in the system that it's not a monolithic structure? So logical decentralization would mean that um, like one heuristic is just basically like if you cut the database in half, does it still have its kind of um, semblance of what the data wants to describe? Um, so then of course you have to move to the two by twos. <laughs> um, so if you look at how these technical systems map to political organizations for decentralized governance, um, you could see that politically centralized organizations and architecturally centralized organizations, so in the sense that um, Architecturally centralized in the sense that the infrastructure that makes up the company or the technical system is relatively kind of top-down controlled. It's not distributed data throughout all the nodes in the network. Um, and also politically centralized, usually a hierarchical form, you get traditional corporations, or today what you would call firms. Um, and then if you look at architecturally centralized and politically decentralized, you get something like direct democracy, where there still isn't necessarily a technical system that's strictly decentralized or there isn't um, a national grid that everyone maintains and inputs to, but there is a form of kind of direct democracy in the sense that as a political subject, I can cast a vote autonomously. Um, and then there's a few other kind of examples. There's blockchains, there's common law. There's also, if you look at logically decentralized, um, you can look at things like how languages are produced, Esperanto, English, etc., cetera, um, and what the kind of different architectural, political, and logical uh, forms of decentralization produce. Um, and then this is my a diagram that I made that failed, but I've been working on an essay on at the moment. Um, so in trying to describe what decentralized governance means, you have to take into account the fact that you have a technical governance protocol in a peer-to-peer -peer system. You also have technical peers. So if you want to say like a decentralized governance of a computer network, you have computers running a node, um, and then you have the kind of rules by which they run that node. Um, but to say that that's decentralized governance, I think, is, is not a holistic measurement. So you also have humans or environmental peers. Mm -hmm. 
I only to go back to the, the previous slide again. Can you can you discuss again the, the difference between logically centralized and logically decentralized? Sure. Um, so I think it's easiest in comparison with architecturally decentralized because architecturally decentralized, you could say like how many nodes drop out of the system and it still remains the system functioning. This would be how much of the data is equally distributed across those nodes that the system still has enough kind of data or um, you know, information that it still looks like the system. Okay. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, that's it's a little bit of a simplification, but you could say um, architecture is like nodes, logically is like information. Mm. Okay. Or data. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I just recommend also reading this piece. It's a good one-off. It doesn't go into much more detail than this. It kind of gives a broad overview. Um, yeah, didn't want to interrupt this, so no, no, it's thought. fine. Um, so yeah, just additionally, like you also have human and environmental peers, but you also have the resources governed. So in a normal social political party, you could say you have money governed, you have commons governed, but also if you're talking about a technical system, you could say the data or information, the kind of logical structure of the system, um, is something that's being governed by the network nodes. And you also, in the same way that you have a technical governance protocol, you could have a political or social governance protocol, and in human and environmental peers. And it's really loose to this ambiguation between where one of these starts and one of these stops. You could put environmental peers under resources govern. You could do any vice versa. But um, this is mainly just to highlight that like, there's a lot of ways to talk about decentralization. Are you guys familiar with the Gini coefficient? No. So the Gini coefficient is a measure of basically distribution of wealth or resources across a given kind of subset of a population. So it takes basically the kind of curve of what that distribution of wealth looks like and it measures that as a slope and says that this is the kind of coefficient line of like how equally wealth is distributed across a subset of a population. So often when people talk about distributed resources or decentralized resources, they're using that kind of measure as a state sanctioned version. Um, but that's, talking about that in terms of resources governed doesn't necessarily make sense to then graph that onto um, looking at like how many nodes in a network run a full node. You could also do that, but that's not necessarily a prime uh, kind of approach. So decentralized governance, some more kind of concrete examples. It's really big in blockchain. Um, so um, just to give a quick introduction to it as well, so blockchain is not just a currency, it might not even be a currency, um, it has a lot of different speculative trajectories that in my opinion are not determined yet, it's not really dead but it's, it's not really alive either. Um, so one really simple, um, I think useful definition of blockchain is that you could share, say that it enables a shared public record of interactions between people without guaranteeing institutions. Um, so you could say that it's a technical system that I say this is the state of the system, I verify that this is the state of the system, and then the network says I agree that this is the state of the system, and through this process of agreeing that this se sequential period of acts has happened over time, that you have a public record of all the acts that the majority of people agree are the canonical history that has happened in the world, in this blockchain fictional world. Um, so what does this actually look like? Um, the one funny note is that um, the word blockchain actually comes from the Bitcoin white paper, but it was only mentioned once in the Bitcoin white paper um, as a chain of blocks. So it's this kind of word, similar to like Adam Smith's, um, you know, the whole like invisible hand of wealth thing was like mentioned once in Wealth of Nations, and then people grab onto it as a metaphor. Same, same with blockchain. So people kind of took it and run from the Bitcoin white paper that was released in 2008. Um, but it's become a kind of pictorial metaphor with Merkle trees or others to say that um, in a blockchain, each block contains a publicly verifiable history of interactions and a pointer to previous interactions, which creates a consensus history over time. So you could say, um, you know, because its first use case was money, you could say I gave um, $5 to this person, this person gave $10 to another person, that person gave $7 back to me. Put all of that in a block, everyone agrees on it, and it's a stamp in history. But it also contains a reference to the previous block in the form of a hash. So it's basically kind of like a ledger book with discrete blocks of time saying all these things happen between people. Um, so you could say block zero, that's happened, contains a reference to the next. Um, and one thing 
on, on top of this, just having a shared record, because you know, if this were um, you know, just so easy, why didn't it exist before? Why don't people just normally do this? Why doesn't history work like this? Is because you need some kind of um, often like incentive or otherwise to keep people doing it. Um, so blockchain protocols usually provide some sort of incentive um, for the people, or often called the miners, who are verifying the blocks. And usually that reward is financial. Um, so to return to the earlier definition, so blockchain enables a shared public record of interactions between people um, without guaranteeing institutions. But because it's primarily a technical network first, um, the kind of things that are interacting in the future could be different things. So it could be people, companies, AIs, agents. You don't necessarily need to be a person verifying the transaction. Um, so what is um, a governance of these kind of protocols? How do they exist apart from incentives? So in a blockchain, um, there are various different stakeholders. So in the same way that they provide incentives um, like miners, um, so miners receive a fee for verifying the blocks in the chain. Um, but then, so they're just one kind of governance style stakeholders. If you start thinking about the blockchain as a model UN, these are all the different roles you would play, basically. Um, so the miners um, listen for transaction requests and verify them and give a for a gas fee or some type of fee. Um, and then there's also developers who program the technical system. And then there's nodes. Um, so nodes usually download the record of transactions and they validate, sync, and store and share consensus on the history of transactions. The incentive for this um, is so that uh, basically you have better security and also you do others a favor. The more records of all the transactions that are distributed, the better the health of the network. And also for some people who are quite paranoid, you want the full system on your machine at all times. Um, and also, there are users, so any user who executes a task on the blockchain, whether it's sending money or in more complex blockchains like Ethereum, um, interacting with an application. And then there are also coin and token holders. So people who hold things like Bitcoin and Ether um, have a stake in them going up or down or otherwise. Um, so this is like a really rough overview. Some, some blockchains are different than others, but if I were to do like a, a LARP and be like, these are the roles that you play in maintaining a blockchain network, these would be about the five categories of stakeholders. Um, so the main question then is like, if you set up this blockchain LARP, how do developers, miners, nodes, users, and coin and token holders make decisions about the blockchain protocol outside of the current technical specifications and incentives? So it's, a, it's basically a distributed computer program that a bunch of nodes are running. If something goes wrong, how do people fix it? And how do people decide and coordinate to make an update to the program? <coughs> if there's not necessarily one canonical kind of update that goes around. Um, so in practice, this has looked like a few different things. Um, so we'll get more to DAOs with Pat's um, presentation. Um, so just allow this definition to kind of not be so important right now, but you could say it's just like code on a blockchain. So in 2016, um, this project's called the DAO launch, and this was on top of Ethereum. Um, and basically what it was, was a Ethereum code-based VC fund. Um, so it was the idea that a bunch of people could interact with the smart contracts and basically give Ether, the native currency of Ethereum, in exchange for some token that was associated with the DAO, the application called the DAO. And with this token, they could use it to vote on projects that they wanted to fund that would make proposals to the DAO. So you could say like a normal VC fund, like you know, maybe some small startup comes and pitches to them, and they're like, I have this great idea for like a better coffee maker. <laughs> like something that was do with like Shark Tank style. And then everyone has, who's a part of this software-based organization can vote on whether they want to fund that like really stupid coffee maker. So this was the idea in 2016 that you could do a kind of distributed fundraising company and you wouldn't need necessarily the kind of, to, to raise capital from just a few individuals, you could raise capital from a full network of people interested in a kind of computer network. So with this, um, they were like, great, they built the code, they set it up, um, there was a lot of nuances. It was one of the first kind of co really complex smart contract application that, that was launched. And um, a bunch of people, I remember it actually this day in June uh, 2016 when a bunch of people started putting money in and then it got up to 150 million, which at the time was the biggest crowdfunding that had ever happened. And then a couple of days later it got hacked and all, most of the funds were drained from it. 
Um, and so what do you do then? <laughs> Basically, like, in this decentralized network, how do you coordinate to deal with something that's both like a major technical issue, but also you just built some software where people lost a lot of money. How do you deal with that legally? And there's no legal infrastructure set up to deal with that at the time. This was all super new stuff. No one had any idea what to do. Um, so that's when I kind of, there was decentralized governance by the nodes and the technical and the network. There's also decentralized governance of, and a social layer of decentralized systems. And they still don't match one to one, but the DAO is a good example. So basically, because the blocks are a consensus history over time, um, there's this idea that blockchains are immutable. Um, that you know these discrete time blocks have happened, everyone agrees there's a canonical history, and that's that. That's the state of the network forever. But since it's a computer program, what you could feasibly do is something that's now known as a hard fork, and, or it's been known for a while, but this was a, one really big example of a hard fork, where you actually choose a point in time or a given block and say, well, I won't get there yet. But so there's the question of how do you get these stolen funds back from the DAO hack back? Um, so basically the community could fork the blockchain in order to revert stolen funds to their rightful owner. Um, and this would in essence like invalidate all transactions that occurred from a certain point in time. And like the, the visual metaphor works in the sense that you have like a canonical chain of blocks and then they split. And you say from this point in time and the time's moving this way as an arrow, you say I want to go from here and I want to say that all the funds that were taken from the DAO have never been taken from the DAO and we do not recognize that as canonical history. Um, so this brought up a lot of contention in the community um, because there was a lot of people who said the whole idea of blockchains is that they're immutable and actually their autonomy and their essence and their institutional guarantee as protocols is that they can't be reverted by any party. Um, so then of course um, people were kind of like, well this is a lot of money and we're probably in trouble and what do we do? Um, uh, so then there was like a lot of discussion because also there was a time limit uh, they had about 27 days before the, an update in the protocol happened that they had to make this decision. So what was done is like a lot of people met in person, people who wrote the code, um, large token holders met. A lot of people knew each other, but there were still a lot of anonymous people or people outside of the network that were implicated in this hack. Um, so what they did was just talk about it, and then at first it was like maybe we don't fork, maybe we do fork, and then there was this like <laughs> there was this vote put in on an online platform that said like do you want uh, the DAO as a hard fork? Basically, do you want the funds to be reverted and to go back in time and say that Ethereum is not immutable and we'll make this decision? Or do you want to just have things continue as they are and say the protocol reigns supreme, protocol as institution is kind of you know, de facto, and then, so basically they allowed, they did this vote just on a website, um, and basically everyone who had Ether was allowed to vote, and your vote was weighted by how much Ether you had. Um, and so they did this vote and it was like overwhelming, like yes, let's hard fork, let's get the funds back. But the thing was, only about 6% of all Ether holders voted in this. Um, but what they did was, uh, I, they were like, okay, well, you know, clear <coughs> consensus, this gives us some legitimacy to make this decision as technical developers to do the hard fork. <coughs> so it was kind of, you, you see the kind of like, um, you know, self-justifying aspect and the legitimacy of the decentralized governance of the protocol. Um, so they went ahead and did it. Um, I think I think everyone was kind of glad that they did. It was it would have been a big loss in early Ethereum if some of the main holders like were already kind of out. But so there was the kind of normal Ethereum chain that continued. ETH was still ETH as a currency. But from that fork, there was still the original chain that kept going, which is now known as Ethereum Classic. And those people are kind of diehard believers in um, immutability and actually quite nice people. Um, but they they aren't um, as an active community for application development or anything. Um, but so this, this proved a crisis of like, how do you really find the legitimacy to make a decision in a decentralized network? And there was the kind of you know, big outcry about like, what about the immutable autonomy forever that this new, new technical system proposed and have we just sacrificed it because of a technical mistake? Um, and there's also, there's actually a lot of examples like this now. Um, this was actually a little bit after, but still close in 2017, Bitcoin had a similar episode where people wanted to increase the amount of data the network could process. Uh, and, and basically a lot of people were for it and then against it. They were signaling online with like voting platforms. Um, and then a few people met in New York and were like, we're not gonna do it. <laughs> and they called it the New York Agreement. And everyone was like, okay, well, <laughs> great. 
and then this kind of went on. But there's a lot of like um, ambiguity and, and strangeness in the community and, and kind of real cognitive dissonance about having a distributed network that runs on its own versus the kind of social complex decentralized governance layer. Uh, did that sort of make sense? Okay. Um, so, and, and then, so that was kind of like governance of the protocol and of the infrastructure um, on a social layer, but there's also governance by the protocol in producing decentralized governance. Um, so a lot of that is under the hood of what is called today decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, so this is something that kind of, I think I have a little definition here. Um, it originally came about, I think, because people wanted to do companies that were like legally unstoppable. <laughs> and, uh, and that has since um, changed a lot. I think it's become much more, in a positive way, like egalitarian and supportive of smaller cooperatives and other initiatives too. Um, so a working definition of what you would call a decentralized autonomous organization would be like a software-based organizational tool that lowers the cost and uses incentive design to coordinate for common goals. So what does it lower the cost of? Um, so I don't know if anyone's been involved in setting up co-ops, but usually there's like membership fees and registration fees. They're not usually so prohibitive, but then if you want to go more towards like a limited company or a larger enterprise, those fees of setting up those enterprises become quite high. Can you uh, like talk about what a cooperative is in case you're sure. familiar? Sure, sure. Um, well, so there's a lot of different ones. Um, I'll pull up actually, how this fits with other things. So, so you can define a cooperative as these really nice, I think, like seven principles, which I don't have memorized, but um, it's by like the International Association of Cooperatives or something like that, that they publish these standards online. It's a nonprofit. So it's the idea that it's um, a membership-owned organization is at the core. So there's not necessarily, um, it might look like a normal organization where there might still be like a kind of board of directors and members. So it's not necessarily that everyone has an equal role, but everyone has an equal stake in what is produced by the cooperative, ideally. So all members have a right to one vote. There's no priority of one vote given to another. All members have a right to the profits that are produced, and all members have a right to stewarding the kind of commons or stewarding the endeavor in which the entity is set up to be. So it might be in you know, a normal company, it might be like some people have equity, some people don't, some people are kind of you know, less both, but it goes both ways as well. Some people are less owners of the actual resources, and some people have more risk than others. That's, that's one thing that company forms usually distribute risk just as much as they distribute profit. So if you form a limited company, it might be because you know the three directors of that limited company or the three C-level take on an inordinate amount of risk. Whereas in a cooperative, it might be that people share that risk equally legally. Um, so it's a legal form that allows kind of um, equal ownership of an endeavor. And often um, with the principles of cooperatives, usually the guiding principles is that all profits made by the organization are reinvested to the benefit of the organization. So they're not always nonprofit, but what is done with surplus revenue is a common question. And you know, most private endeavors, that is definitely not the case. Um, so with smaller cooperatives and stuff like that, DAOs have become quite I wouldn't say popular because it's still like really early and really niche, um, but have become a kind of interesting tool for smaller cooperatives. Instead of having to, you know, do expensive voting infrastructure or kind of, you know, just even getting a bank account as a cooperative or as a company, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, who are the members, etc. Um, you know, personal example, I tried to do a cooperative in London. Um, I'm, I'm not a UK resident. Um, well, I was a resident then, but not under any visa. Um, and it was impossible to get a bank account because I was registered on the company and I was a non-resident. So as we see, and we'll talk about DAOs, there are real infrastructure kind of problems for just starting up a small endeavor that I think these applications actually tend to fix. Um, on a larger scale, there's definitely higher ambitions. Um, but what a DAO is, is like, it's quite small despite the big name. <laughs> is that it's just like a software-based tool um, for lowering costs. And then also, a lot of them use incentive design. So if you look at um, for the, how the DAO vote turned out as a software-based tool for people to coordinate, you know, that was 6% of all potential voters took part. And then um, what if there was some incentive for people to vote, either monetarily or reputation-wise or otherwise? Um, would you solve the problem that's from, usually known as like voter apathy? 
Um, so it comes with both good and bad, because monetary incentives do not fix everything. Uh, but people are, are experimenting with the different types of like game theoretical or monetary things that could fix a lot of common organizational problems. Um, so with DAOs, um, this is kind of governance by the protocol. So rather than thinking of like, how can we govern decentralized software networks, we're also like, how can we use these networks and applications built on them to facilitate and organize and govern our organizations? So there's this idea of off-chain or on-chain governance. So off-chain governance is kind of a normal, <laughs> real person governance where you just talk it out, you vote, um, you have a parliament, you just decide decisions ad hoc, but you don't necessarily have something that's codified in a blockchain. Um, and then on-chain governance um, would be something that you have a clear representative kind of image of that particular act on on-chain. So that could be something like incorporating weighted voting systems for stakeholders or um, simple things like, you know, one person, one digital identity um, gives you one vote in a software-based organization. Uh, you could also do one token, like in the case of the Ethereum vote, um, and you get one vote. And the problem there is you get plutarchy, like rule by the wealthy. And then you could do something, well, how do you fix the civil resistance problem, like people creating a ton of different identities, and you could say, well, you, you have to verify like 50% of your identity with some identity documents, or there has to be some part of your identity that's public knowledge, and then that would give you half of a vote. Or you could do a kind of poll vote as well, based on the identity. Um, and then there's also the question of like anonymous identity, then if it's less verified, do you have less power in the system? And then there's the question of do, you, do we actually want digitally verified identities? Um, and to me, I, I actually tend on the side where we should preserve uh, pseudonymity at all costs. Um, and it just matters about how we legislate and how we produce legal forms and policy making to allow pseudonymity to not prevent uh, responsibility and liability. That's a whole other topic. Um, but there's a bunch of voting mechanisms, which I have um, links to in other slides as well. Uh, so there, these are like kind of funny terms, but like Q-tarchy. Um, has anyone heard of liquid democracy? So liquid democracy is super interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll do a super quick overview, but definitely like read more about it here. Um, so I think it was actually the Pirate Party in Germany experimented with it a bunch. Um, the, unfortunately, they're not super active anymore, but they were for a while. Um, at a very simple level, there's, there's more complex levels, but like it's just the idea of like I delegate my vote to this person. Um, so you could say that it's kind of like re representative democracy, where you know you elect your se senate or your parliament member, and you say they represent my vote. But liquid democracy proposes doing that on a much more granular level. So you could say I want to delegate my vote to this person in regarding to these types of policies in these types of situations. And that person can then choose to delegate their vote for these types of situations to someone else. And it kind of forms this network tiered of being able to delegate votes, but also to be able to pass kind of opinions upstream, right? Where you don't necessarily have conglomerated or single kind of points of identity and points of political representation, but you have aggregates of rough social opinions that are formed by actually the social graph of people. Does it make sense roughly? Um, so you could say like, online, like this person takes all my votes, or you give them all your representation. There's a lot of these voting mechanisms that start becoming more formalized as soon as they become, as soon as they intersect with computer programs, basically, applications. Um, and there's also this slew of um, like game theoretical problems that a lot of these voting systems seek to solve. Um, so there's things like the prisoner's dilemma, all these are worth Googling, you probably have heard of the tragedy of the commons, is a quite common term. So it's, um, it's a little bit debunked, and, but it's, it's a very persistent sociological meme. Um, the idea that if you have something like a kind of shared resource or a commons, like a kind of open field that a community is supposed to attend to, and everyone is supposed to feel kind of shared responsibility to attend to this field, um, not everyone will. Or it might be something that it becomes actually disabused and overused and underused due to um, the fact that there's not one single point of responsibility or multiple clear, explicit types of responsibility. Um, but I really recommend here, um, I'll add it to the references, is reading Eleanor Ostrom, who does a lot of work on commons and debunks this to some extent. But it's a really persistent, um, when you get to decentralized governance and kind of peer-to-peer -peer networks, everyone talks about the tragedy of the commons, like it's an indefeatable game theoretical thing. Um, like 
there's no way we can come to kind of common terms for governance of resources. <laughs> um, yeah, and I don't know, maybe maybe I'll just stop it there because then I have a little bit more about DAOs, but maybe Pat can give some more practical examples or we could take a break, quick break or any questions. How's everybody feeling? I feel like I've talked for a while. There's a lot of information, but go up. Oh, I, I guess that, so you said those are the most important patterns? Um, oh yeah, so this is me copying just a tweet of someone. Um, so this is these are the most important like game theoretical patterns. Oh, so it's not necessarily about P two P. No. So per se, okay. No. So it's more about kind of um, how do you stop bad actors within a system. So you could say that a lot of um, computer science issues are act are asking like how do you stop the kind of um, bad actor in a given system. So there's like Byzantine fault tolerance of just being able to send one message from one node in a network to another without that message being tam tampered with in the middle by like a middleman or whoever intercepts it. Um, so you can say that that's a game theoretical problem that like on a technical level computers actually have to solve. Um, so these are important patterns that like decentralized governance seeks to provide some incentive to have not happen. I see. I didn't know the initial returns was game search Sorry, oh, um, well, some of those things that I wasn't sure if it was game theory or not. Um, but yes, I, I will, I will ask you more questions after it's about. So the normal Bitcoin is just the one without any changes. Whereas Bitcoin Cash forked, and I forget, they did block size limit and they did one other protocol update. Um, but BTC was the non-segwit. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you use your example of uh, like the, the Ethereum fork mm -hmm. and how only what, 5 or 6% of people actually participated in that vote? How has that sort of, that was such a momentous decision in sort of this space of like, how do we deal with this big problem? Um, how do you feel like it's informed approaching these similar big issues uh, going forward? And do you feel like, I mean, 6% of people as like, or having only 6% of like the community participate doesn't seem like that great, but at the same time, yeah, I guess how do you also incentivize more participation as well? Yeah, um, so I think things have changed slightly since then. They haven't gotten necessarily more participation, but it's more visible what people are thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so since then, there's a group called Ethereum Magicians that was kind of self-created, so not the core developers of the protocol, but a community started initiative um, that seeks to kind of build tools, but also voice community opinions. Because there since have been um, like new updates to the protocol or new proposals for future changes that have been contentious in the community and have required similar kind of voicing of opinion. Um, so since then, there's been a lot more community initiated in initiatives to actually meet face to face and talk in working groups about the proposals that are happening. Um, in terms of voter turnout or participation, um, I think. There's a certain acceptance that of a network like Ethereum, 6% of a turnout is actually not as bad as it sounds. Um, and I think that that is like a practical reality that some people have accepted because it's not necessarily on equivalence of like civic duty um, to hold the currency and thereby show up. Um, I think there's still not really a clear answer of how do stakeholders in the network signal their preference. There are the things that like miners or nodes can switch to the new upgrade, and that's the strongest um, <coughs> kind of signal that, or that's the actual act that will show whether an update is taken. Um, but there's still a lot to be desired in terms of how the community itself facilitates changes. I think a lot of that is being done in the DAO space with smaller networks of people that then signal to the kind of broader community.
mentioned to you, I have a lot of references. That, that's exactly what I was um, Which I will share and maybe get to at the end. So basically, um, all of these so that I would probably like to say a little bit about after past weeks as well. Um, so more kind of practical examples, but also essays that give broader overviews of all of this. Because I'm also coming from a background of, um, you know, now I work in blockchain, but I used to work a lot in kind of smaller cooperatives and organizing. And now there's like a conflation and a joining of those two communities that's still not clear to everybody. Um, so there are things like, to look into it in terms of tools, there's Lumio, which is just a tool for decision making um, that smaller cooperatives use. But then there's also things like past, present, future from co-ops to crypto networks, which is a good piece. Um, and then there's also patterns for decentralized organizing, which is more on the social side. Um, yeah, there's a lot of like deep dives, and I wasn't sure which area to go on more, other than to say that not all of them are synonymous. No, so it isn't. That's that's why I wanted to kind of keep. Because this is where it gets so difficult because it's like it's not technically decentralized but the cooperative that built Lumia called Inspiral is a group a network of people originally it was just a few people building software <coughs> and now I think they're a network of like 200 plus people who do different endeavors they still build Lumia they still build other software applications but they have this really strong onboarding network where they invite someone to join the Inspiral network and then I think it's something like three months you have like a buddy who teaches you about the organization and what they do. And then, and then if you still want to be a part of it, it sounds like cult even it doesn't, it's not that bad. And then you kind of figure out like which department you want to act in. And it's actually, so this thing, um, Patterns for Decentralized Organizing, Richard Bartlett, the author, is actually one of them, I think original founders of Inspiral, the cooperative that built Lumio. Um, so a lot of this is about how to maintain non-hierarchical kind of forms in company organization. Uh, so this is where they, they're coming on the kind of decentralized governance of centralized systems side. Uh, but really important now because I think that they are now very much in dialogue with people who are building technically decentralized systems. Um, yeah. I'd be curious to see, I don't know, but if Lumio, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, has a has been able to, in some way, kind of like, uh, like, solve that problem of voters' apathy that you were mentioning before. Like, obviously, in a, with, with a different substrate, uh, but I think the problem of this, uh, on, like, governance or on-chain voting often, uh, yeah, there's uh, the, the problem of voters, turns out, uh, it's pretty, Big. I don't think that any project has actually solved it, but I was wondering whether, I don't know, maybe they could all learn something from some, something like Lumio, for instance, so that is kind of, yeah, designed to facilitate these governance processes. For sure. Maybe I show another thing related to that. Um, so, so Lumio is a nice because it's just like an interface where people vote. So you can say agree, abstain, disagree. It's just like a little software tool. It's centralized. Um, but it's really nice for this kind of, if you have a smaller organization, it allows you to introduce like a kind of finality to decision. You can say that this ends then, and that vote is accepted by your community. Um, there's also, I mean, there's so many tools to kind of make voting online work better, and so many different types of incentives. <laughs> you guys will get this in the notes. Um, but. So there's, there's a lot of kind of different voting tools that also intersect with identity. So you have voting um, using a currency that you already have. There's also vote buying. So there's like reputation um, extended, like how much ETH you have as your vote is weighted by that. But you can also do tools where you're, um, one interesting method called QB, which is also in the notes, is quadratic voting. So it's the idea of like maybe you're given 100 vote credits and with those 100 vote credits, you're allowed to buy um, normal votes, or the, let's see, like vote credits and real votes. And with those 100 vote credits, you can buy one real vote with one vote credit. But if you want to buy two votes, um, then you have to use four vote credits to buy those two votes. 
So each time you try to buy more and more votes, they get exponentially more expensive. So this is ideally so that people who have a lot, large amount of vote credits, or in the real world you call that money, um, don't, aren't necessarily one-to-one -one able to equate their purchasing of vote power with what it is in the world. But also on the adverse side, you could say that more, it allows people who really care about a given issue to voice that they care about this issue extremely. But then it also, because they're giving up all of their money or their vote buying to care about this issue extremely, they're hopefully less likely to able to act on other issues as well. Um, of course, we know not in a perfect world that isn't necessarily the case. So that's what QB is and corporate QB. Um, and there's, there's a mixture when you kind of take vote buying and you put it with reputation, when you put it with identity, or stake is a term that's really popular at the moment. So it's the idea that you kind of like lock tokens or hold stake um, or show kind of your ability, like a lot of people say, put your money where your mouth is. Like, so for Ethereum will um, transition to a new type of power dynamic where people lock Ether in order to kind of act in the network and it will be a protocol change. Um, so you could say that you put stake into what you believe in. Um, you'll hear this phrase a lot, but it's the idea that you have like an opportunity cost that allows you to be able to take part in governance. Um, there's also issues of like how are things initially distributed with online systems. Like if it's one-to-one -one identity or if it's coin-based, um, you know, you get a lot of things like Ether was just like a pre-sale. Like if you had some money and like you could buy it online. <laughs> um, and there was not really, I mean, there, there was a pre-sale where it was given to specific individuals and obviously people who are part of the network are much likely to have more. Um, but there wasn't necessarily a rhyme <coughs> that that initial distribution. So for people to think that Ethereum should become some sort of like public utility or public network is quite absurd in my opinion because it's, it was a, the architecture of the initial distribution had nothing to do with the public utility. Um, and then, yeah, there's a lot of different models, goals, prerequisites. <coughs> and really what it requires in my opinion is like a valid stakeholder mapping and um, a valid type of reputation mapping and distribution mapping. I think it's quite complex. Um, but a lot of these software tools aim to kind of deal with the most important patterns that we see show up in general kind of day-to-day -day voting. If that helps. Like Lumio doesn't do any of these things, but you could see I'm quite sure like they're hanging out with a lot of the quadratic voting people now. I'm quite sure they'll have a quadratic voting module in like, you know, a year's time. I, I would bet on it, you know? Um, so it's nice to see those things converge. <laughs> so a lot of decentralized technical builders with you know decentralized patterns for organizing. Um, so like definitely recommend reading this book if you're interested in the social side. <laughs> Hopefully it's not like I hope all of these resources are helpful and interesting primarily. <laughs> um, yeah. Anything else? Should we take a quick break or do we want to keep going? We need to take a break. Quarantine. Okay. Yeah, thanks for
So uh, I think we're going to start. I'm actually I'm a lot slower uh, during my presentation. If I was, uh, you know, if I was sitting down right now, I, I think my head might be uh, near capacity. So we're going to talk about three things today. Um, the first thing is we're going to kind of do a whirlwind tour of institutional economic theory. <laughs> Very slowly. The second thing is we're gonna talk about uh, four DAOs that have lived and existed and tried and failed in some respects to be effective DAOs. And then I'm going to uh, offer you some prognostications on the future of DAOs. So we, we talked about this quite a bit um, in the previous lecture, but a decentralized network is a cryptographic P2P network to create an immutable timestamp public ledger. We talked about um, Ethereum mostly, and we're going to continue to talk about Ethereum mostly because most of the developments in this space are Ethereum based. Now we're going to zoom in a little bit um, and we're going to go from the network to the DAO. Um, and as the uh, SEC, our, our friends, uh, the American regulators, have uh, determined it to be a virtual organization embodied in a computer code, 
and executed on a distributed ledger or blockchain. And I think this definition is valuable because they are a government agency and this is what they're saying. Vitalik, um, who we already discussed, added sort of an addendum to this. Uh, DAO has internal capital, the ability to be used as a mechanism for rewarding certain activities. And I'm, I'm inclined to believe this is true because when we think of governance, you could have maybe governance of something that isn't, you know, profit seeking. Maybe you could govern the rules of a board game or a basketball game. But when we look at something like the NBA, they sure do find a way to monetize that. So uh, even in the examples where we think of governance as, as not um, being uh, capitalized or, or profit seeking, rent seeking, uh, th there is a money component in a sense. And we can, we can think of it uh, kind of like this. We can think of the decentralized network uh, as a big city. You know, Ethereum is a big city, it has utilities, it is providing water and sewage and electricity in the form of, uh, you know, code uh, languages, coding languages that are used in the smart contracts. And then we can think of, of a DAO as, you know, maybe, maybe a building or a company or, um, you know, a, a piece of that city. And we're gonna talk about those pieces. So uh, we, we wanna start with a question here when we're going through our tour of whirlwind, our whirlwind tour of institutional economics. And our question is, if free markets are, are actually efficient, um, you know, why do people uh, use businesses? You know, what, why are there institutions and hierarchies in our society at a smaller uh, level? And we can, we can kind of compare the two. Um, you know, markets, uh, we have these decentralized coordination uh, mechanisms that are controlled by price, they're controlled by supply and demand, uh, kind of an economics 101. And then firms are, are, are centrally controlled nexus of contracts, and we're gonna jump into that. So what, is, what does that mean? So the firm, it's, it's a legal fiction, you know? Uh, it, it serves as a focus for a complex process in which the conflicting objectives of individuals are brought into equilibrium. And this is, this is kind of diving into the problems that uh, were articulated on that, that one slide in the, the last lecture. You know, when, when we think of uh, the agent principle problem, where I'm uh, you know, a manager in a company and I'm making decisions on behalf of someone else, we need some sort of legal fiction to protect that person because me, as a, a rationally self-interested manager, would do bad things otherwise. So we create this idea of, of contracts, and we say, listen, if I do something that you know, goes against what the contract says, you, uh, the person I'm making this decision for, can sue me, and I do not want that to happen. So we can see that uh, a firm, it's, it's this organization of, of contractual arrangements you know, between these different groups of stakeholders. And we can think of them as shareholders, directors, employees, suppliers, customers. And we kind of come to the conclusion that the reason that we, we don't have a market, that we are organizing as a firm, is that we're trying to reduce the cost of us doing business together. Now, what, what are the costs of us doing business? You know, there's, there's uncertainty. Um, there's unforeseen contingencies, information problems. I know something that you don't know, and you know I'm not gonna tell you because then I can use that to, to make money off you. Uh, there's a the cost of writing contracts. You know, every firm has an operations department. This is what they do. They get a nice big chunk of the budget to do it. Uh, and then there's the cost of enforcing contracts, and we call that the judicial system. Um, and they make sure that we are uh, abiding by this legal fiction that we've invented. But generally, what we can say is that the higher the complexity of working together with someone, you know, the more it's gonna cost uh, in terms of these different transaction costs. We have here a kind of a, a mind map of institutional economics. Um, you know, we have the theory of the firm as reducing transaction costs, um, uh, a nexus of contracts. We have institutions that, that sort of make up these organizational structures that, that we create within markets. Uh, pardon me. Markets being one of those institutions. Firms being one of those institutions. Governance being one of those institutions. But now uh, we have blockchains. 
And blockchains are, are sort of fundamentally different in their architecture and what you can do with them than governments, firms, and, and markets. So, so going back to transaction cost firms, uh, they get more efficient at reducing transaction costs because they, uh, they introduce these rules, these contracts, uh, and they address the most uh, common uh, conflicts that, that we tend to have. What we think blockchain can do or should do is, uh, what, what it could do is perhaps move that back the other direction. So perhaps we can structure contracts differently uh, with smart contracts that uh, will move us back to markets and, and uh, away from firms. So we could conceive of a market that has a similar level of coordination uh, as these nexus of contracts firms uh, do today. Sorry, I just didn't understand. Are you saying that blockchains are less uh, transaction efficient than firms? The cost of transactions in blockchains is higher than that in firms? I'm, I'm saying uh, they can structure uh, a nexus of contracts that is more efficient and looks more like a market. Uh, so it's lower cost than higher. Yeah. And we have, we have a beautiful quote. This is from the reading uh, that was assigned that uh, one proud member of our cohort did. Um, uh, a firm is a nexus of contracts, but specifically a nexus of incomplete contracts. In a world with zero transaction costs, all contracts would be complete and all economic coordination would go through the market. The implication is that blockchains may not compete head to head with firms, but rather may carve out those parts of firms that can be rendered as complete contracts. So those, those parts of the business which we can structure as a market uh, with a blockchain, uh, we can certainly try to reduce the transaction cost by doing so. And I say try there because I, I don't know if we succeeded yet. Um, and here, here are the reduced transaction costs kind of, kind of spelled out. Um, you know, we have increased transparency. On a public blockchain, you know, you can look at the receipts. You can look at every uh, financial transaction that's, that's gone through, the, through them, uh, maybe with the exception of, you know, privacy mechanisms that are being invented currently. But, but generally, we know what's going on, and we can see what other people are doing. Um, we, we have these self-enforcing rules, so instead of an operations department, um, you know, we can simply have a smart contract that does something based off of some conditions, and this should ideally lower the cost of having to hire an operations department. Um, and, and then we have economic incentive schemes. So we can think of you know, new game theoretic uh, structures where people can come together and work together um, that are not uh, necessarily a legal fiction, but actually just giving money uh, in the right uh, amounts and the right manner to the right people to organize a certain result. So I'm not, I'm not going to go through all this, um, but DAOs and decentralized networks kind of have different issues. They have some overlapping issues um, that they're, they're trying to solve. And this is something that's probably good to go onto Wikipedia and look up all the different language for, um, but it's, it's definitely a resource for you to, to, move, to check in the future. Now, I, I want to say, um, you know, this, this is not the idea of a DAO, the idea of like this, um, you know, ecosystem that is reducing transaction costs, um, it's moving away from the firm, more towards the market. It's not something that is only being explored in the decentralized space. Um, McKinsey put out a, a, a great report in, in 2018. Um, we believe an increasing number of industries will converge under newer, broader, and more dynamic alignments. Digital ecosystems, wow, what does that sound like? Where users can enjoy an end-to-end -end experience for a wide range of products and services through a single access gateway without leaving the ecosystem. The relationship among these participants will be commercial and contractual, and the contracts, whether written digital or both, will formally regulate the payments or other considerations trading hands, the services provided, and the rules governing the provision of and access to ecosystem data. And I think there's going to be 12 of these ecosystems. So I think in the world, 
you know, on your smartphone as you're interacting with these uh, different ecosystems of services. Um, you know, everything's going to be cheaper for you um, because everything will be going on uh, in, in this manner. So centralized uh, firms are looking at this as well. So why don't we move on to the case studies now that we understand the economic theory behind it. What, what can a DAO govern? So there, there's sort of three things that we can imagine um, this uh, more atomic unit. It's not really a city, it's more of a, a business type thing. Uh, there are three things it can govern. First is capital, you know. It can govern tokens, cryptocurrencies, and, and possibly in the future some sort of physical property, although we, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, it could govern a, a network or an application. So um, you could have something like Uber. And that's decentralized. So instead of a company that is rent seeking, you know, making money off these drivers, uh, basically maybe the drivers are the ones uh, dictating the, the future of the company. Maybe the uh, consumers and the people actually riding on Uber are the ones dictating the future of this company. And they're doing so uh, through this guaranteed um, uh, smart contract governance, um, where again you have that transparency and, and you have some sort of governance system that is programmatically enabling them to do so. Um, and, and finally, uh, we can we can think of DAOs. Yeah, go for it. Um, I had the, how how would it be able to actually govern uh, physical stuff? Do you think it, it would be like I know it's still not, but would it be able to, or how like would it need to work with the government or? or? Yeah, I, I like to use uh, you know the idea of a, of a DAO coffee machine. You know, since we're talking about coffee machines tonight. Now imagine, imagine a coffee machine, and every time you use this coffee machine, you earn some voting power in the coffee machine DAO, a very exciting DAO. And with this voting power, you can now dictate uh, some of the parameters of the coffee machine, perhaps the flavors that this machine will offer. Um, you know, perhaps you get some uh, profits, you know, uh, people have to scan a QR codes to access the machine and receive their delicious, delicious beverage, and now those profits have to be distributed in some manner, and you as a, a paying individual have earned the right to, to claim those profits. So you can, you can have governance of the sort of the smallest, most, most primitive physical object, or we can really start to, to move this up and scale, um, you know, maybe some sort of commons uh, type situation where, you know, people living in a determinate area are, are governing uh, a, a lake or, or maybe a, a self-owning forest that is uh, you know, governed by the people who are planting seeds. Uh, we can conceive of a lot of theoretical things. Nothing has really come out of this so far. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the things that possibly do. I think you need more uh, legal permits. Yeah, right. um, I, I think that's probably the solution here, uh, a greater incorporation of, of soft governance and uh, you know these more institutional forms of governance. We, we wrap the DAO in a, a legal wrapper, we say this is a partnership, um, right. and then we, we utilize a, a court or some other uh, mechanism like that. I'm gonna talk about that in a bit. Um, anything else? There are also those 12 things that you said, uh, that you mentioned that 12 uh, things in that slide before. I don't, I don't remember. The idea you said that there are 12 Okay, so, so what, what I was saying here is that this report um, believes that there will be 12 uh, digital ecosystems um, that emerge by 2025. So we'll have kind of this autodopolistic uh, structure of, of firms that exist. And we already kind of do, if you look at 
which corporation owns what corporation. We'll just see it more in the, the digital realm when you're actually using the applications and engaging within these ecosystems. So the, the third thing a DAO could govern is curation. Um, how, is, how is curation governed today? Well, if we look at Reddit, Reddit is my favorite curation platform. You have people upvoting and downvoting uh, uh, delicious content, um, and the best content goes to the front page of Reddit, uh, presumably. Um, a DAO could, could basically do the same thing, but a DAO could introduce um, you know, some sort of, of game theoretic uh, structure to it where perhaps that curation is, is more accurate because you are uh, staking some sort of financial assets and, and saying, you know, th this will go to the front page and I'm putting some, some skin in the game, some, some money, believing that everyone else will put it on the front page. Um, in going through these examples, we're going to, to I, I want to float up a couple of discussions, and I'll be talking about this. Um, you know, soft versus hard governance. The, uh, is it relying on off-chain communication, um, or is this DAO simply uh, executing code as law, or is it a mix of both? Uh, money versus merit. Uh, is the governance structure uh, entirely plutocratic, or is there a way for uh, folks to earn um, their way, means of, of participation? Um, is it politically decentralized? Are there any uh, patterns in this governance structure where a single individual or a couple indiv of individuals are making choices on behalf of the, the collective? Um, final things to consider. Uh, DAOs are at the end of the day driven by humans and we're going to, to understand values, uh, objectives, and, and culture. I'll, I'll bring that up with a couple examples. And uh, UX UI, um, I have screenshots from each of the governance, each of the governance DAO examples that I'll be discussing, um, and we can take a look at those. And these are our four lucky winners of uh, today's use case discussion. I've tried to pick uh, across the spectrum. So, so what is Decred? Uh, Decred is not. Uh, in Ethereum blockchain, uh, it is its own uh, blockchain. And, and what is the DAO governing? Well, the DAO is, is governing the, the network as a whole, so it upgrades to this uh, blockchain <coughs> network, and it's governing uh, a pool of funds uh, which are used to improve uh, this network. The voting power of this DAO is distributed by uh, ticket, and to uh, get these tickets, you have to lock uh, the, the assets, uh, DCR, um, for a minimum of 28 days, and, and they expire when they're not used. Um, these uh, tickets, they foremost govern the Decred blockchain, um, that when, they, uh, when you have a vote uh, for a network change, uh, you submit your tickets, and uh, you know, a majority of tickets causes a, a change in the network. But they are also used to govern this treasury, where 10% uh, of the network's inflation, 10% of the uh, uh, DCR uh, that is issued um, is put in a separate uh, account and with these tickets you can vote on how this money is, is used. Um, the, sort of the problem with this uh, treasury though is, is that ultimately the funds are approved and distributed by a, a moderating entity. Um, uh, Decred Holdings Group LLC um, before they are distributed. So there is a centralized operator that is managing these funds. This is what the uh, network upgrades look like. Um, this is uh, basically the same as an Ethereum fork. When the Ethereum network upgrades to a, a new version or if there's something contentious and it splits to a different version. And this is what uh, governance of the treasury looks like. So, uh, you know, we have a, a nice visual of how many tickets were submitted uh, for and against. Uh, we have a little ticker there in the middle that determines you know, how much of the threshold we need, uh, and, and we're going by a, a relative majority here. Uh, a relative majority being within a given time frame, uh, you need to have uh, this percent of yeses at the, over the, the, the ticker to uh, uh, pass the proposal. I'm sure there's a better way to say that. Um, and, and this is kind of my analysis of it. It's, it's actually kind of cool that they have a UI 
with network governance. You know, if you if you look at Bitcoin, if you look at Ethereum, they, they don't have UIs for this. The, the fork is not executed in any sort of a democratic fashion, um, uh, I would say. Um, so this ticketing process is not purely plutocratic, and I, I also think that's good. You know, you have to have some skin in the game to, to make these decisions. You are blocking this, this uh, you know, financial asset that they've created. Um, and, and just a review to have skin in the game is to have incurred risk uh, by being involved uh, in achieving a goal. The risk that you are incurring is the, the price of DCR going down or the opportunity cost of not having access to this asset. Um, community stakeholders have a mechanism to improve the project. You know, that's, that's nice when you, you know, have a means of, of contributing, because a lot of blockchains, uh, there's simply no mechanism for you to contribute. Um, some cons here, uh, uh, Politia, their treasury management application, it's neither politically nor architecturally decentralized. You know, this is, this is running on a server, this is being managed by a company, um, and that company is effectively a middleman. So there's, there's no smart contract guarantee here that this is what's going to happen. Uh, the emphasis on this strict legality uh, is what's causing this loss of decentralization. You know, they don't want to step on anyone's toes, um, and if that was an actually decentralized entity, it would kind of exist in a, a legally gray area. Um, and, and finally, uh, going to the human layer, this project does not seem to have any values. Uh, uh, other than creating a private money. And, and that's not a value in itself. Uh, loving nature and, and wanting to clean beaches is, is a value. You know, wanting to uh, liberate uh, the people of Hong Kong, I hope you're not listening to China, is a value. Um, wanting to manage a private money is not a value in itself. So this is our, our second DAO. Um, and this DAO is exercising curation. It is governing uh, a, a registry, and this registry is a registry of identified individuals. Um, and basically all they're saying is that, yes, I'm me, I'm a unique person, I want to be the, on the list of unique people, um, I would love to be on that list. Uh, so to do this, uh, first they, they stake, uh, again going back to staking, uh, a small amount of Hume uh, tokens, uh, uh, as a candidate to, to join this registry. And if they uh, do not successfully uh, pass, you know, if they're not voted in, they lose their stake. Um, the idea is that token voters are incentivized to curate the list honestly, and that this will generate demand from uh, new applicants to be a, a part of this registry. And the first uh, 10,000 applicants are rewarded with Hume tokens uh, through this successful proposal. So there is you know, kind of a social mining process here. Uh, you apply, you pass, you get a nice reward. Yes. This is, uh, again, um, what it looks like. Uh, it seems that Roberto Di Piace is uh, definitely not a person, um, but our other two people uh, probably are assuming that the registry is correct. And here's, here's my analysis. I, I think this is useful. I think this is good. It's a good prototypical primitive. You know, other, other DAOs, other organizations need to validate who is and isn't a person. You know, going back to the discussion of quadratic uh, funding or quadratic voting, that only works if we know who's who and we can identify who's who. Um, we can th think of this as a governance primitive in that respect, which is a basic building block or module that provides a needed or useful solution to other DAOs. But there's a lot of bad things about this. One, there's weak incentive alignment. You know, the, the voters, they're not getting anything for voting here. You know, you're saying, oh, the price of the token will go up. Um, you know, in, in economics, we call this pushing on a string. You know, that's not how strings work. Um, the voters are actually losing money voting because the cost of the gas fee is more than the secondary sort of uh, appreciation of the price of the Hume token, uh, it, most likely. Um, there's no way for the DAO to punish malicious behavior, so if just a handful of folks get all the tokens, you know, they can just start registering whoever they want, um, which in itself is not an issue, but if another DAO is referencing this DAO to verify the identity of its participants, uh, now you've created sort of a, a social vector, a social attack vector. 
Um, finally, there's no collective governance of these contracts. Uh, they, they don't belong to the DAO itself. They belong to a team. The team is responsible for updating the, 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 the registry contracts if they want to do another version. Uh, and the team is also managing all of the leftover human tokens. So, so there's no management of capital. There's no management of contracts. This is an entirely centralized operation that's gone into creating this registry. And, and that kind of gets a, a D um, on my decentralization uh, governments. I don't know. I don't know what, you, what would you call this? Scorecard. Scorecard. Yes, it gets a D on my scorecard. <coughs> Our third example is the Maker DAO, um, one of the more known and highly disputed DAOs in this space. Um, the Maker DAO. Uh, uh, is basically managing a, a, a DeFi application where if I have Ethereum and uh, you know I want uh, another asset that is more stable, you know, because Ethereum is going up and down all the time, I put this Ethereum in a smart contract and they give me something called Dai, and Dai is a, a stable coin um, that is representing a, a single dollar. Uh, so I am collateralizing this contract with one asset to receive another asset, which is uh, supposedly stable. Um, now, how do they govern this platform? All, all voting is done through the MCR token. So they have a token, and this is 100% plutocratic. We want to do something, we are simply calling it to a vote uh, of the token holders. And there's there's two types of votes that they call. One, one are polls, and uh, within polls, there's no action taken. Uh, and, and the second is what's called an executive vote, and uh, you know, once the MCR holders uh, you know, ratify this, this vote, uh, uh, it's binding on chain. So something happens. Um, the MCR holders, they, they govern uh, uh, a limited set of parameters uh, within this application, this, this decentralized finance application. Uh, the list of parameters is on, on your right-hand side if you want to dive into it. Um, <coughs> One thing to note is that all votes are called by a, me a member of the MakerDAO team. So, so there is an individual here who is uh, the decision maker when it comes to whether or not a vote should happen. This is uh, what it looks like. Um, I actually think this is a terrible interface. And I'll tell you why. It doesn't say who voted no. You kind of have to know that, right? We see 52,000 MKR in support, but, but how, how much of MKR is voting the other way? You know, that is going to affect my decision as a, as a person. If I see someone saying no, I'm gonna think, oh, someone's saying no, maybe I should say no. So it does change the results. Um, an individual uh, kind of identified a problem. He said, and this, this goes back to, to August, and he created a discussion thread in the, in the MakerDAO forum. He said, why are people voting? You know, what's going on? Because they were receiving a very limited uh, amount of votes. Uh, and then he kind of identified uh, these four reasons. Uh, these are not my reasons, those are his reasons. You know, he's saying, one, the cost of voting is too, too high. Um, there's a combination of informational opportunity and gas costs and make voting undesirable. You know, you are paying to vote. Again, this is the blockchain. Um, there's a lack of transparency. So, so we don't know how these votes are being called. The Maker, MakerDAO Foundation is deciding um, what we vote on. Uh, there's really no transparency to this process, which if, if it's going to be a blockchain process, should be transparent, right? Like this is why we have blockchains. Um, he suggested uh, two solutions. One is uh, perhaps the ability to delegate your votes, uh, and the second would be rewarding voters for participating. So here's, here's the scorecard. Um, first, again, I, I really like what they're doing. Um, I, I like DeFi applications. I think this is the future of finance. I don't think we need banks. I think we should get rid of banks. Um, we should get rid of these middlemen. But what we should not do is introduce new middlemen to replace the middlemen that we lost. Um, the reason this is not working is because you have a high level of political centralization. You know, the, the people who are deciding what to vote on is the MakerDAO Foundation. They are the ones calling these votes. You know, it's not the, people, the MCR holders, M MKR holders, who are making this decision. Um, so there's this heavy moderation, 
the application and the application's contracts are controlled by them, ex explicitly so. You know, all of the, the, the collective treasury or supposedly collective treasury is controlled by them. You know, they have all of the MKR tokens which are not uh, uh, distributed. Um, this, this is not decentralized governance. You know, this, this is largely theatrical. And so it, it scores very poorly, in, in my opinion. But it's, it's cool. It's another cool prototype. Yeah, Excuse me. Yeah, go can, for it. Uh, can they act? How would they, is it actually possible to let the, the, the holders of the token be able to suggest questions? Or is it technically hard to do that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And in the, the next uh, example, they actually do exactly that. Have I gone through three, two, three, three? All right, so this is, this is our final example. Um, this is my favorite. It's the DX DAO. Um, the DX DAO is powered by DAO Stack. I work for DAO Stack. So you know, there's, there's kind of a natural alignment there. You know, what, what is it governing? It is uh, governing uh, the smart contracts of, uh, of an application on the Ethereum blockchain, the, the Dutch X auction protocol. Um, uh, probably built by Gnosis. Um, and it is uh, governing uh, capital. So it has uh, uh, 200,000 uh, gem tokens. Uh, this is the token of the DAO stack project uh, in, in its uh, treasury uh, currently to, today. Now, how, is, how is the voting power distributed? So it's distributed by a month long uh, locking and auction po uh, process. I'll go into that in a second. Um, sorry to talk about that. And the, uh, the proposals in the voting process is, is done through prediction markets, or a form of prediction markets. Um, we call it holographic consensus, and I will also dive into that. This is by far the most complex of the four examples, so uh, bear with me here. So this is uh, how the reputation was distributed. Uh, we can see that 88%, uh, no, pardon me, 38% was generated uh, by locking tokens uh, or Ethereum for this month long period. 50% uh, uh, through trading on the DutchX protocol, it, it generated this, this token uh, called MGN, which is basically saying, hey, you're, you're a trader and you've generated this much liquidity and we're gonna reward you <coughs> with this token. Um, and that makes sense, right? Like if you are trading on this protocol, which is a trading protocol, you probably should be the one to determine the future of the trading protocol. Um, there was uh, an option for 10% of the voting power uh, for the gen token was, was used as the, uh, the asset within that auction uh, and, and that's how they got their 200,000 gen. Um, and we don't have to worry about the 2%. I don't know if I need to talk about this. I'll talk about it. So uh, the, the DX DAO sort of has three uh, archetypical things that it can do. Uh, the first is it can distribute funds um, or it can distribute voting power. Uh, we call that contribution reward. Uh, the second thing it can do is it can interact with uh, other contracts on the Ethereum blockchain and, and do things with them. Uh, and we call that a generic scheme. Uh, and finally, it can register uh, new modules to itself. Uh, it can upgrade the contracts that it controls. Um, and we call that the uh, scheme registrar. So if it, if it doesn't like the way it's being governed, it can say, hey, we're gonna move on to another version of ourselves and we'll, we're gonna change our, our governance contracts and we'll have a vote through the scheme registrar and that will do it. Now, how, how does it uh, you know, go through this uh, consensus making process? Well, it goes through holographic consensus. Well, what's that you might say? Um, I'm gonna walk you through it. The first is, you know, if, if there are four of us in a room you know, and three of us have ideas, and we got to decide what the best idea is. It's probably not that hard, right? We'll just look at the three ideas, we'll read through them, and then we'll, we'll take a vote, or I don't know, play with rock, paper, scissors. There's, there's got to be a way to solve this, right? So all of us are looking at these ideas. Okay, so what if there are 16 of us, and we have 20 ideas? Um, you know, without some sort of dedicated investment of our attention, we are not going to be able to understand those 20 ideas well enough to come to an informed consensus about uh, which is the best idea. 
So how do we fix this? Um, basically, uh, we've created a prediction market where if you have a uh, thousand ideas, you know, a hundred ideas, I, I don't care how many ideas, uh, you run it through the market and the market says, you know, this is a good idea and I'm going to uh, predict, uh, you know, that this is a good idea, that it will pass, the voters agree that it's going to pass, um, and I'm, I'm going to put some skin in the game uh, to, to, to make this prediction. Uh, or going back again to staking. And what this prediction market does is it sorts the ideas. So we have a list of 100 ideas. Uh, now the 10 at the top are the 10 that, uh, you know, the predictors have sorted to the top that have, you know, the most skin in the game. Um, and we call this the conversion of uh, social arbitrage into economic arbitrage. How does this look like in practice? Uh, so again, here is an interface. Um, we can see at the bottom there are six ideas which have been you know, uh, uh, basically sorted to the bottom or they're, they're sitting at the bottom. And then uh, we have six ideas at the top. Uh, they have received enough predictions uh, that they will pass. Uh, so they have been moved to the top. Um, and you can see uh, with the little numbers on the bottom right hand side of each card, you know, how many people predicted yes, how many people predicted no. Pardon me, how many tokens were predicted yes and how many tokens were predicted no. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the DAO is uh, intrinsically biased to predict no. So the DAO predicts 150 tokens no by default, and the reason it does this is to protect against spam. So if you could submit a uh, thousand proposals um, and it doesn't cost you anything, that's, that's not very effective. But if you have to, um, you know, stake against this DAO's uh, auto downstake, uh, it becomes very, very uh, prohibitive for yourself. And this is this is all just I'm just freezing over this. If you really want to dive into holographic consensus, uh, you got to go online to do that. Um, this is what a proposal looks like uh, within the system. You can see the predictions. You can see the votes. You can see who voted. Um, and you can see the, the proposal itself. So let's let's go to our handy scorecard um, once more. You know, one, uh, this is a decentralized proposal submission process. There is no moderator. There is no one saying we will vote on this, we will not vote on that. So we, we fixed that problem. Um, again, community stakeholders have a mechanism to uh, propose project improvements. Um, that's that's nice. It makes people feel like uh, they can improve. And, and, and make it better, right? You know, that's, that feels good. Um, and it has full control of both the application smart contracts and, and the capital that it's governing. Uh, th there's no centralized intermediary that's, that's determining that. What are the bad things? Um, so the voting power distribution uh, didn't necessarily work in a super decentralized way. Um, after this month-long period, there were seven or eight people who ended up controlling 50% of the vote. Uh, we had this nice power distribution, but it was maybe too nice of a power distribution. Um, it's still unclear if there was some interest uh, during this phase, this one month phase. You know, traders did get 50% of the vote, but you know, people were staking, there was a list of 50 tokens, and, and we don't know if all of those tokens were necessarily invested uh, in the governance of this uh, entity. And the reason that this is important is because uh, we can introduce another concept called path dependency where the dependence of economic outcomes on a, depend on the, the path of previous outcomes um, uh, rather than uh, current conditions. So it's like a, the Titanic, you know, it's, it's sailing straight, we can't turn it, and um, you know, maybe we simply needed a, a different distribution to make the choices that we need to make effectively. And, and kind of the final thing on this is there is an unclear legal status. Like, this, this thing is totally decentralized. Like, where it's, it's not, there's no legal wrapper, there's, there's nothing of this kind, and, and so we don't really know uh, what it is. We kind of have an idea that it would be treated as a partnership uh, by a government. It's just hard to imagine, you know, a partnership that exists on six continents with 400 members. You know, that, that's very hard to regulate. So we're, we're moving towards the end of the presentation. This is a taxonomy that was created uh, by Greenfield uh, Capital. They're, they're based out of Berlin. Um, they invest in governance projects, and they have kind of this neat uh, way that they've sorted uh, different types of <coughs> DAOs, uh, essentially, and decentralized networks. Uh, I'd recommend you check it out. 
Okay, so we get to the fun part. You know, what, what do I think about the future? Right? I like this part. Um, so our, our biz dev team uh, has kind of identified four uh, sectors that we want to focus on. Um, I call it the DAOs and practice framework. Um, the first is ecosystem funds. You know, uh, di different projects in, in blockchain want to distribute funding uh, to people to support the project. Um, we actually do this exact thing. We have a DAO, uh, we call it the Genesis DAO. It is the DAO of the DAO Slack project that is, uh, basically exists to uh, improve, develop, and, and grow the DAO stack ecosystem, and it's, it's been really successful, um, actually. Um, collaborative networks, so, uh, you know, we want to approach Facebook groups, Discord servers, you know, basically anywhere where there's this, this online digital network, and we want to see if we can turn it into a DAO uh, and give it uh, governance over some asset, over, or treasury. Um, blockchain aligned NGOs, um, you know, this just seems like a, a nice sort of, uh, you know, industry sitting next to ours. Um, you know, we talked about uh, in, in Spiral briefly, but basically people who sort of match that profile. You know, I think they'd be very open to some form of blockchain governance. Uh, and then some sort of decentralized acceleration. So can we, keep, can we create uh, some sort of uh, smart contract uh, competition, um, for instance, a hackathon, uh, where the funding is distributed by the hackers and not two or three judges. And we're going to do this at ETH Denver in February. We're shooting for 1,400 judges for a pool of $80,000. And we're gonna see what happens. It's gonna be a really fun experiment. Um, you know, what do I think we'll see? Uh, we'll see more uh, DAO primitives. Uh, we'll see them in areas of conflict <coughs> resolution, identity, uh, registries of, of DAOs and, and audited modules. You know, every smart contract that a DAO is, is registering to, to itself, um, you know, ultimately creates a type of security vector. And it, it, it costs a lot of money to, to audit these effectively and understand that they're safe. Uh, so there will likely be a registry of hey, these contracts are safe for your DAO. Um, and finally, legal wrappers. You know, I, I think this will be, the 2020 will be the year where we finally start to see uh, more physical uh, applications because uh, more standardized legal templates and frameworks will be available for these digital organizations. I think we'll see clearer legislation. So uh, I included a copy of the German National Blockchain Strategy uh, for you all. Um, it was published in English about a month ago. And they're having a, a session on Friday that I'm attending. I'm really excited about, you know, regulation is fun. Um, I believe we'll see more specific interfaces for predetermined use cases. You know, the, the financial industry is huge. Um, besides decentralized finance, we have decentralized insurance, um, uh, Maybe, maybe I shouldn't use decentralized finance specifically, but, but publishing and media, there's no reason you can't curate uh, content. There's no reason you can't curate a, a television channel. What shows do we want on this channel? Okay, this is a registry. Let's start curating it. Um, who do we want the, the, the person to be who, uh, you know, is on the nightly news? I don't know. Uh, okay, that's a curation question. That's something that can be governed. Um, we'll see more integrations, um, so DAO apps will start working together. I, I included the underscore protocol. This is a decentralized wiki uh, integration that is being uh, offered to all DAO stack DAOs. Uh, a gentleman named uh, Pepo is developing it, he's out of Barcelona. And that's gonna be awesome, because we will be able to create decentralized constitutions and role play as nation states. Um, more applications controlled by DAOs. You know, every, Every centralized application is an opportunity to be uh, disrupted, to give ownership into the hands of the people who are uh, you know, actually adding value to that company. I love to use Uber. I, I love this example. The drivers matter. The consumers matter. The board of executives does not matter. So why are they getting all of the, the, the profits? You know, we can invert these relationships of rent seeking, and we can empower the people who sit at the bottom of the pyramid um, with transparent governance. And, and my final prediction is that most, most DAOs will die. You know, in the startup industry, I think it's 97%, 99%. I don't, I don't remember how many die. It's more than 90% though. Um, and if we have anything comparable here, uh, we're, we'll see the exact same thing. We're, we're just going to see a bloodbath, you know, um, as people experiment and, and really iterate on what they've done. Um, I don't know if I have to go into this, but this is an example of a DAO 
experimenting with a legal wrapper. Um, the legislator in Vermont in the United States created a legal personality called a blockchain-based limited liability company. Um, we, the team behind this uh, worked together with the lawyers who wrote this legislation um, and, and then incorporated themselves as this. And they are running on, on DAOSTAC today. And, and these are their articles of association um, where they're basically saying, um, our governance is determined by uh, uh, the DAO on DAOSTAC. This is how we run our uh, uh, developer cooperative. Um, final bits, a uh, couple of resources for you all. First, uh, this is a design canvas. Um, you know, if you've ever been in a startup, you've probably used one of these before um, just to figure, figure out your product market fit and your strategy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we created one for decentralized organizations. Uh, this is a, a real hit because it might be the only one in the world. Um, and it lets people start thinking about, uh, you know, how, how should we structure our own DAOs? And we've gotten some, you know, some really amazing ideas that have come out of this workshop. Uh, if you go to DAOcanvas.io, you can download it and play with it yourselves. Um, have at it. Uh, and then finally, this is the last slide, I promise. But there are two DAO creator applications that exist. Um, one of them was not working today because they were pushing an update right as uh, Kia was testing it. Um, and I just got a notification about that now. Uh, so, so the second one, uh, the second screenshot here, this is uh, the DAO stack DAO creator. Um, the, the first screenshot here is the Aragon uh, DAO creator. Aragon is another DAO framework. Um, it, extremely modular, uh, a lot of different voting options. Uh, you can really set up uh, a, a very flexible type of organization on it. Uh, the, as far as the DAO stack one goes, we, we have drifted towards uh, holographic consensus and, and that's sort of the consensus making that all of our DAOs have uh, for the time being. So it's, it's much less flexible, I would say. And that's it. Oh. Uh, any questions? Did, did we take that slow enough? No, no. So proud. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this is being spearheaded by Bundesblock. Yeah. Um, they're, they're an NGO uh, that are basically um, trying to bring together the right people to, to start thinking about this uh, with the German regulators. They had a session uh, last Monday. The German finance minister was supposed to attend. He couldn't make it, unfortunately, but there were four or five uh, projects, ourselves included, uh, that were invited to present. Uh, there were 20 or 30 uh, government staff uh, who were a part of that. Uh, the session on Friday is, is a little bit less um, prohibitive in its membership. You know, I, I got an invite, so that tells me something. Um, and and from, from the initial conversations that you either heard or, or, or learned about, um, what is the, the government posture on permission versus permissionless uh, blockchains? And what do you think the difference would would have as an impact on the application of blockchains and uh, and, and, and how they would uh, have jurisdiction on, on a physical realm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't like to put my foot in my mouth, so I I can't say uh, you know they, they have a stance on one thing or another. Um, you it's know, too I, early, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I think it's too early. What I what I was told, uh, I spoke to two individuals who were there last Monday. Uh, Michael Zargon of the, the Common Stack Project. Um, we had a fun uh, role-playing game night last Saturday. Um, we talked about that, and then uh, of course my, my uh, CEO, Nathan Field, uh, he's a government specialist <coughs> as well. Um, both of them said that uh, you know the, 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 they're very open, you know, to it. That the reception was positive. Um, they are trying to understand this as best they can, and they're approaching it from a place of curiosity and not a place of. Uh, you know, we have to restrict and eliminate this. Um, oh, that, that's very encouraging. Uh, because the, the reason I ask is because one of the mental barriers I have myself in sort of understanding the adoption of blockchains is this case in which uh, there is some kind of physical uh, 
realization of the data server blockchain, like say Google's apps, right? Uh, but then what would happen if the blockchain that stores the information of Google's apps uh, was forked, for instance? Like uh, in, in, in Kia's talk, she mentioned this uh, you know, DAO stack. Yeah, so uh, scientifically we know uh, a wormhole opens up and the universe splits into two. And <laughs> okay, no. okay, I'm glad, that, I'm glad that's an option. Uh, to, to, to be honest, um, I, I don't think anyone knows this. You know, uh, <coughs> I, I, the argument that I subscribe to is that you know, we've reached a, a threshold of, of what I call architectural stickiness where the, the dependencies at the bottom layers of the stack, you know, the Ethereum blockchain itself, are not actually, uh, you know, going to, to fork in a way that would cause uh, this level of disruption. Right. Um, you know, may, maybe that's uh, too optimistic of, of me uh, to present. Um, you know, I, I have to say, this might be something, again, that, that uh, a, a legal, legal rapper um, We'll, we'll fix where we we introduce again this this uh, this legal fiction and we say uh, the 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 chain that is the canonical chain representing the governance of this asset is the chain by which we come to consensus under rules X Y Z. Oh, cool. Um, I, I would just I, I would say that's my band aid solution on the fly, standing on a stage in front of you know, twelve people, but I don't know. I, I guess I would say that in terms of. Um, Question: um, How how often are you seeing DAOs being actually like?
like utilized by projects, whether like and, and I guess you can utilize a DAO on many levels. Like a micro part of your organization can work kind of within a DAO, or um, yeah, you can have maybe something bigger and more complex. Um, but how often do you see DAOs being used? And even if they're not necessarily being used, how much do you see like just the evolution of the DAO and talking about the importances that or uh, some of the values that a DAO brings, it's starting to inform some of the projects in the space. So whether that means uh, transparency, understanding. Um, what I like about DAOs is that they're, they're very clear how do you participate. And I think with a lot of projects, it's not very clear as to how you participate. Although you talked about how some of the UI was real shit in some of these like DAOs. But there is sort of this idea that, you know, it, there is a system that you, you follow and, and hopefully that's a bit more transparent and clear as a participant. Yeah, I'm going to start with the, the question. Um, you know, how, how often are these being used? So I, I did a little uh, landscape study uh, for internal purposes um, for, for DAO stack. And uh, in terms of uh, DAOs uh, and, and, and not decentralized networks, mind you, I'm not talking about blockchains. I'm talking about uh, DAOs um, more strictly uh, related to the Ethereum network. Um, you know, I, I think I, I identified six with more than 50 active participants. Um, you know, there's there's plenty that maybe have one or two members, um, but but I wouldn't call that a DAO necessarily because you haven't reached a, a threshold of political decentralization. But that again, that I uh, feel is necessary. Um, you know, we're we're kind of in a taxonomical soup right now when it comes to that. Like, is a is a wallet a DAO? Is it, you know, what's a DAO? Um, so that's why I'm, I'm kind of emphasizing that point. So six, that's that's my answer. Um, the, the second part was, was about the evolution of ideals and, and values, right? Yeah. I, I don't know if, if we've really witnessed, um, you know, what I would, I would characterize as, as being, um, you know, a Cambrian explosion of uh, ideals or values. I don't think people really understand how these things can be used yet. Um, and I, I don't expect them to because we are at such a, a primitive state. You know, this is this is like the internet in 1994, 95. It's going to take us another three or four years before this really offers uh, value as a as a as an instrument um, that that can be leveraged for more idealistic pursuits. Um, we did have a DAO on DAO stack uh, organize and clean up a beach, which was pretty cool um, in Curacao. Uh, they, they also created a, a research report, um, uh, some 40 pages long, on how they would approach Dalify and Curacao itself. Um, and their their specific ideals, idealism is to, um, you know, create sustainable uh, development uh, architecture um, for the island nation. And but that's the only sort of really prototypical you know, DAO I can think of, which is uh, trying to follow uh, a higher vision or, or a higher goal. Um, and they, they are just so, they're directly involved with us, and, and so they have access to the understanding that we do uh, about DAOs. Uh, if I was talking to a random person on the street, you know, yes, they have ideals, they have beliefs, they want to influence and change the world, but we don't have a supporting interface um, or even a thorough enough explanation of the blockchain to onboard that person effectively and realize that vision. Yeah, I guess and part of my question was also about like even if, if people or projects don't um, work on a DAO or they aren't a DAO themselves, uh, do you see increasingly more projects that are becoming just more transparent on? Um, so based on your scorecard, mm -hmm. like um, how would projects generally rate? in some of these areas that you were sort of rating, um, even if they weren't DAOs? Like, are you seeing distributed sort of governance work or voting mechanisms work within these projects without having a DAO? Or at least sort of, uh, yeah, trying to decentralize some of this governance in, in a transparent way? 
I, I think that would require a pretty in-depth study on uh, you know, horizontal uh, management strategies and horizontal organizations. Um, again, in Spiral being a, a great example here. Um, and that study would have to sort of compare uh, the, the efficiency of this organization um, in achieving its, its goals versus the efficiency of a traditional hierarchical organization that is you know, less transparent, less inclusive uh, by nature. I have not read such a study. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I can necessarily comment on that. Uh, do you see a connection between DAOs and anarcho syndicalism in, in terms of how you want to organize and, and frame work and you know, be with people and do something? What, what was it? Anarcho? Yeah. Oh, what's, what's the full term? Sorry. Anarcho syndicalism. Can, can someone define that for me? <coughs> Um, I guess it's like a, a way, like a, a um, group of people, of worker that owns the means of production of your factory. So, like it's a between like a co-op, I guess, and uh, um, I don't want to say much more than that. Yeah, either, this kind of this sounds delightfully Marxist, but maybe I'm wrong here. Um, I mean, I'm saying this because like you were saying that like, you were like, Explaining DAOs as you know this new thing out of the blue, and I was just wondering if there's like any like historical background that you can like you know link to because nothing has like, you know it's like these things are not like are new in this way but have like other. Uh, I, I think if we were tracing the historical thought, um, you know, we we would sort of start um, with the new institutional economics. Uh, sort of school of thought, which was you know late '80s, early '90s thing, and you know they they borrowed um, a lot of their thinking from Hayek. Um, so so if we were start kind of going to the, the originator in a sense, and I'm I'm no uh, academic by any means, I would I would start with Hayek. But I, I don't know if that's uh, anarcho. Um, and I don't know if, it, if it's an that can close that.
so that's how I see it becoming a kind of like self ownership of the production of the river. So does that relate at all to what Trent from HADV was talking about? Like if rivers can't vote, but AI could be further will to give them agency, is it related to this idea that you want to represent more things in the Individually, but yeah. I would hope so. Yeah, it could be dogs. We don't know. No. Um, there are some multi sigs, which is kind of interesting. Um, so we have a we have a DAO, uh, and, and some of its member addresses are actually multi sigs, and it's it's kind of a it's it's interesting because it adds a dynamic of sort of federalism. Um, federalism. We have, we have these these five seven person organizational structures um, with the multi sigs, which are now in a DAO, which has you know, two, three hundred members. Um, so you're, you're you're starting to get in this nice nested uh, pattern of interaction. So there's like multi cities and multi cities. I mean, I, th I think you could have that. I, I wouldn't call a DAO a multi sig uh, per se, but but if you sure. have a multi sig that has some bearing representation in the DAO, but then part one of the, the signatures for the multi sig is itself a multi sig. Does that happen? We we've had. Uh, so what we're building towards, um, which will happen someday, is is DAOs within DAOs within DAOs, uh -huh. um, all all with different uh, you know voting rights, different ways of, of you know interacting <coughs> with each other. Um, we we built our architecture specifically to support this. We just haven't had many instances of it being needed so far because we haven't started to see yeah. you know ultimately this mesh uh, emerge. Just because it's so limited in, in the amount of DAOs currently. Mm -hmm. There's a nice state, multi state, you can have a multi state, be an owner of a multi state, yeah. you can have a multi state, be part of DAOs that now. You can do this. Uh huh. And so there you go. What is the word for like, it's not the ontology, but like the hierarchization of things? A body. Like, say if you had the. Taxonomy? Tax, is taxonomy a word? Taxonomy, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what is the. What is a, a, a better or worse taxonomy for, for, for DAOs? You say, like, how would you decide or what understanding do we have so far about instances of which we would need uh, hierarchy for these kinds of relations or groupings, syndicates, whatever? <coughs> yeah. I don't think you need to look at DAOs to, to understand that. You know, I said, I, I don't think you need to, to look to DAOs. You can look at you know the, the the shifting of any sort of confederal political system mm -hmm. into a, a federal federalized one, where you know you do have a, a federal policy, and then you have state policy, municipal policy, uh, you know your neighborhood um, association. But are those form bottom up or top down? Usually from bottom up, like smaller entities form unions with bigger ones. I'd say it's complex, you know, because okay. you have situations where states, you know. Overrule the, the, the federal entity. Oh, sure. I just mean, like, in the case, for instance, like DM25 is arguing for a federal government in Europe, right? So I like the book. Yeah, the book. Yeah. Um, so they have a bunch of states that have representation, but there's no collective representation to go from. So that, that's one. Right. Well, you're trying Wait, to. Wait, yeah, know. yeah. It's, it's 8.45, so those of you who thought you were leaving at 8.30. Just kidding. Sorry again. Um, I first just wanted to give Kia and Pat like a big thank you. This is really <laughs>